My name is John Campbellick, your first presenter. I'll uh, be joined later by Derek Oshiko and David Ketter. I'm a volunteer with an organization called People's Voice on Climate. We're the NGO who initiated the first ever People's Assembly in the United States that focused on the climate crisis, namely the Washington Climate Assembly. To kick us off, I'll describe what is a People's Assembly and then give you an overview of the most recent and relevant example, the Washington Climate Assembly that was held and completed earlier this year. People's assemblies are a type of deliberative democracy that's different from the representative democracy we're all familiar with in the United States and other democratic countries. The basic premise of a people's assembly is that they include people from many walks of life who are encouraged to really think deeply and about specific issues. We're really riding a deliberative democracy wave across the country, uh, across the world, and in the United States in a variety of places, including here in Washington State. While people, people's assemblies are not a replacement for experts and governments, they are a form of democratic decision making, and they do provide the added bonus of raising awareness and offering educational opportunities on a variety of issues. Two of the guiding principles of people's assemblies are that they provide people with the ability to make quality, well thought out decisions on important issues, while at the same time acknowledging and respecting each other in the process. People's assemblies are best for highly complex issues where there is low levels of public understanding, and that would really benefit from both awareness raising and education. While people's assemblies are as a decision making tool, do take a lot of time, they are inclusive, consensus driven, informative, and allow for tailored design on specific issues. And oh, they can be really fun too. The role of an assembly member is to express their desires, preferences, and their expectations uh, of four courses of action on specific issues. The role of the assembly itself is not, however, to create complex long-term political strategies, ready to use legislation, or detailed plans of action. The Washington Climate Assembly took the form of a people's assembly. At this assembly, members learned about the issue, took time to discuss it with one another, and then made recommendations about what should happen. But due to COVID, this entire assembly was done virtually via Zoom. But they can be done in person too, as they have around, around the world, or they can, be, they can take a, a hybrid approach. Though growing in popularity in Europe, the Washington Climate Assembly was the very first climate assembly in the US and the first people's assembly in Washington state. Currently, there is now even a global assembly also held online that's focused on, the cli on climate change. The global assembly was introduced to the world at a session during a rec the recently concluded climate conference or COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. There were 77 Washington Climate Assembly members, and they were essentially a microcosm of, of Washington State's larger population. They were selected at random based on a set of demographic criteria like sex, age, race, or ethnicity, for example. The Washington Climate Assembly focused on answering one question, what we call a scoping question, which was, how can Washington State equitably design and implement climate mitigation strategies while strengthening communities disproportionately impacted by climate change across the state? And by the way, mitigation is defined here. At, it really means two things. It, re, it means reducing grease, greenhouse gas emissions and sequestering carbon from carbon dioxide, CO2, within our forests and other places. 
Basically, the Climate Assembly in Washington was implemented in four steps. First, the sortition process, which was the random selection process of assembly members around the state. Then education, which were the learning sessions. And then deliberation, where members discuss what they learned and developed a long list of possible recommendations. Then finally, members voted on which recommendations would go forward, which was their decision-making session. Prior to forming the recommendations, assembly members created and then voted on a set of priority principles that they felt should underpin the entire assembly. These priority principles were formed in the first deliberative session online and served as kind of the North Star in how the assembly evaluated proposed recommendations in all of the subsequent deliberative sessions, as well as the, uh, the final voting session. The Washington Climate Assembly included eight learning sessions where experts in their respective fields presented on a variety of topical areas which, which helped to inform the scoping question itself. And I'm gonna turn it over briefly to Derek uh, for this next slide, and then it'll come back to me. Thanks, John, appreciate it. Um, so my name is Derek Koshiko. Um, I was a member of the Washington Climate Assembly's coordinating team, which was the team that was assigned to facilitate and design all of the assembly sessions, both the learning sessions that we were just talking about and then as well, the deliberative sessions. Um, the learning sessions were open to the public and recordings of those sessions are available on the website. Uh, but the deliberative sessions were closed to the public and were only for the assembly members to be in dialogue with each other. Um, so basically what we had was um, 77 people uh, coming up with um, their ideas and uh, we framed those ideas using a logic model. So there's the iterative deliberations um, involving problem statements, considerations, recommendations, and future visions. And in two sessions, we collected over 500 of these. Uh, well, yeah, four to 400 of these. Uh, and through a process of, um, that involved a lot of mural and a lot of Google spreadsheet and a lot of um, breakout rooms with World Cafe style uh, facilitation, we were able to get um, those 400 recommendations whittled down to 148 that uh, were voted on at the end of the day. Um, and there were also community agreements for um, the assembly members to uh, be in dialogue with each other in a respectful way. And, um, and the solutions did come from the assembly members who were, uh, who came from uh, as, John said this wide um, diversity of folks from across the entire state and across the political diversity as well. Uh, so it was uh, quite an exciting time and a lot of uh, facilitating from a whole team uh, pull pulling those off, but it can be scaled uh, with the smaller numbers of, uh, of recommendations. It doesn't have to be quite that extensive. Mm -hmm. uh, back to you, John. Yep, thanks, Derek. So as Derek mentioned, there's 148 recommendations that were moved forward from the assembly members themselves. And they were categorized by a variety of sectors like transportation, energy, as well as social policies and uh, education and communication, among others. By the way, the middle column in these two slides really is a summary of uh, what the climate assembly members learned and, and that helped them uh, develop the specific recommendations. The approved recommendations were then provided and presented to the Washington State Legislature for their consideration uh, this past spring. About 15% of the 148 recommendations help, actually helped influence the passage of legislation that was already uh, in, uh, proposed during the 2021 Washington State Legislative Session held earlier this year. PDOC, myself and my other uh, volunteer colleagues and others are working to find ways to implement the other recommendations in subsequent legislative sessions like the one that's coming up in the spring. Finally, here's a few quotes from assembly members. More recently, 
Some members uh, actually submitted short video clips about the Washington Climate Assembly to the organizers of a public engagement session at COP26 in Glasgow. We've put a link to that session in a reference list that, that we'll make available to you after the E3 conference, but it's really worthwhile watching that whole uh, session, including um, folks from uh, Washington State. So I'm going to speak about some of the equity practices that we incorporated into the Washington Climate Assembly and that can be incorporated in the classroom or other educational setting. I'm also going to talk about a few models for how some of these concepts could be applied um, either in schools or in communities. Um, so in the, as I mentioned in those deliberative sessions, uh, in the very last session, we held a final vote on the proposed recommendations. And uh, I just really want to emphasize um, that assembly members from a wide political uh, and geographic spectrum came to agreement um, from 80 to 95% agreement on 148 recommendations to the state legislature. Uh, that kind of consensus building is really not what you see uh, in in the polarized uh, politics that uh, have really taken hold in the last several years. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, so some of the practices that we engaged with uh, were um, for how we as a team worked. Um, so uh, our team consisted of a majority of people of color and LGBTQ plus folks. Um, we had an explicit gender and race balance among the facilitator roles. So when we were facilitating, we tried to make sure that there was um, different types of people um, running a meeting. Um, and we also um, ended up having an initial very difficult conversation um, among the, the two parts of the um, coordinating team in order to establish working agreements and a shared power model from the get-go. And that really set the tone for how we collaborated. Um, the team that I, the, the sub part of the team that I uh, ran um, had its own internal weekly check-in to make sure that folks that um, I was working with um, had a place to share and um, get support. Um, and then we also, um, from the beginning and even before the coordinating team was formed, um, the uh, Climate Assembly uh, really wanted to emphasize meeting accessibility needs of participants. Um, so if someone needed wireless, they got a hotspot. If someone didn't have a computer, here's a laptop. Uh, if you needed whatever you needed, those kinds of supports were provided to folks to make sure that they were able to show up. And at the end of it, they weren't asked for those things back. Just have that laptop, have that hotspot, because we're not going to take it back. Um, working agreements for assembly members also was important to help ensure a civil dialogue. Um, and so that's how some of the practices from within the coordinating team. Um, some of the ways that we built it into the um, uh, rest of the assembly. So that scoping question about um, mitigating climate change, uh, greenhouse gas emissions while um, supporting equitably supporting communities um, that built Jedi into the scoping question. Uh, and that was determined before assembly members even um, came in, but it was done through um, another participatory process that involved community members. Um, the selection or sortition of assembly members also built in um, equity and the selection of um, folks that uh, had would otherwise maybe only have one person represented because of the percentage that they represented in the overall state um, was avoided. We tilted toward making sure there were at least two from any one type of population. So. Uh, any mar historically marginalized groups or low um, participation was uh, boosted for all of those. Um, there were metrics and evaluation. There was a professional evaluator that uh, made sure that um, we were tracking um, participants' um, uh, belief in uh, our nonpartisanship and our neutrality. And that um, data showed that uh, for the most part, we were able to maintain uh, the perception of, and reality of neutrality and nonpartisanship while centering equity and justice. Um, we also adapted just transition framework concepts um, and a holistic range of topics into the learning session. So it wasn't just about 
electric cars and solar panels. It was about a wide range of everything that we need to do from restoring ecosystems to um, food and um, every a, a wide range of topics that um, John mentioned earlier. Um, we were also were very careful on who we selected um, as presenters to ensure that um, concerns um, were uh, of people and historically marginalized groups uh, were being uh, addressed in the learning sessions. Um, and then uh, I think I'll leave this here uh, for now uh, in the interest of time. Uh, we also um, did considerable work um, to ensure that we were in right relationship with the state tribes. Um, so three coordinating teams have experience working with tribes. Um, one has was a tribal staff person, uh, one was an indigenous woman, and then uh, one had fossil fuel campaigning experience working with tribes. And um, we had tribal members um, or people working with tribes um, as presenters. We had native assembly members. Um, we reached out to um, tribal uh, contacts to ensure that folks were invited to be um, participants in the monitoring team, which was a group that was formed to provide oversight of the assembly and make sure that um, any concerns that came up were addressed. Uh, and in fact, there was a concern raised by Native folks um, and all work was stopped um, at the coordinating team's decision. And um, we were literally trying to prepare those uh, recommendations for vote um, and design the last session. And we, um, in, in our um, part of our accountability, we just stopped all work and said, we need to address this in a good way. And so um, we uh, responded immediately and then held a special meeting and uh, addressed the concerns and then built those concerns, followed through on the list of items that we committed to follow through on. And we were able to show that their concerns were heard and that we incorporated it into the work. And that has continued to have a lasting effect months um, past that time. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about um, how I personally, suggest folks consider um, engaging with um, a climate assembly. So uh, one of my other roles, um, aside from being the coordinating team member from the first assembly, I also, uh, as kind of part of my weekly work, I mentor a group of youth climate justice leaders called the United Student Leaders. And um, they are students mostly from uh, our local high school that are influencing their local government. And, um, one of their largest campaigns they ran um, recently in um, May and June of this year led to the adoption of a climate emergency declaration by the city of Langley, Washington. And um, the city council voted unanimously to declare a uh, climate emergency becoming the sixth local government or tribe in Washington state to do so um, and joining thousands worldwide. And um, they also demanded as part of their resolution that um, a letter be sent by the mayor to neighboring cities um, and governments, um, local, the county and the state of Washington. And now the youth have their sights set on Island County and sent a petition with over 280 signatures and now are pressing the issue at the county level. Um, that's really a case study in how um, youth can be participating and learning at the same time uh, while creating change on the ground in their communities. Um, so um, I think what I was seen as the key point of receiving, achieving 80 to 95% agreement, uh, I would really like to see this type of thing be used, especially in rural communities. And, um, and I think one of the main tenets of this work was that um, we were educating community members. The learning sessions made it possible to uh, break through um, some places where people didn't necessarily know about uh, aspects of climate change mitigation or other topics. Um, and that schools are in a great position to make offerings to the local community, that, um, that we can make more of these community connections with schools uh, and that the youth have established moral authority. So under youth leadership, uh, they can really hold adults in the broader community to account and not just be stuck in the classroom. Um, and so the, um, the kind of 
charge or call is uh, authentic project-based learning that students can learn while literally taking action in their communities. Oops. Uh, so there's a few models that we brainstormed, John and David and I. Um, so the one that I'm talking about, the student-led, student-run local community engagement project. Um, and in a little while, David's going to talk about how it can be applied in a classroom or in a multi-class project as a school club activity or after school offering, um, or as a process within the school involving the student body over time. Um, so just a few more um, aspects of how um, I see this uh, playing out. Um, one second. Um, so I think any of the models are worthy opportunities and um, whatever you can get done uh, uh, that you feel comfortable um, incorporating into your work, uh, we're here to support you and uh, we can help out. And um, I think it's more important to try something and, and then build on that over time. Um, and, I, and I think it also uh, can be something to build on over time or uh, build up to by uh, making connections with people in the community. And that I think youth will be even more engaged if they know that they are literally influencing a local government. And so, uh, and it's a great way for folks to get uh, knowledge about civics and science at the same time, uh, or social studies and science or civics, all, you know, kind of all these um, different forms of uh, learning. Um, but to engage community members in a meaningful way does um, require um, getting past some hurdles uh, and possibly more time and resources. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, David, but first we'll take 30 second pause. Um, to reflect on this. Um, and then um, David will sh uh, share some other ideas and options besides the one that I provided. So we went from the big picture of Washington Climate Assemblies and then down to the uh, more local level with the community-based student-driven climate assemblies. And now we're gonna zero on in on classrooms and schools and see how it's possible to actually integrate this into the curriculum. And so, uh, but before going into the details, you know, we've already pointed out a number of benefits, but here's a number uh, more of them that we think can definitely be achieved through incorporating climate assemblies into the classroom itself. All students will gain knowledge and skills necessary to be successful with a democratic deliberative process very much needed in the world right now. Build student confidence, empowerment, and motivation through engaging with real world issues. Uh, students will learn to respectfully participate in the process where all voices are heard. Pretty important in our polarized uh, world that we're in right now. And students learn the importance of applying science and engineering to solve real world problems. And they see the integration of science and social studies, which is very important given that most of our subject areas are siloed at the middle and high school level. No, let's see. There are already a number of um, resources available to teachers related to climate, the climate assemblies. And the first one that's listed on this slide is actually a document that's directly from the NGSS world, not so much about assemblies. I'll talk about it in a minute. But the second one, Derek mentioned it, is that all 50 of the 15 to 20 minute recorded presentations made by experts and, um, and interested parties, the presentations made to the assembly before they deliberated are already available online. Um, you can link to them through the Washington Climate Site website, or we'll give you a link to the YouTube channel for it in the resource uh, document that we'll provide later. Another important resource is that I and a colleague of mine, Lisa Eschenbach, created four asynchronous PD sessions that use a total of seven of the recordings from the Washington Climate Assembly. And they're broken down into like 90 minute uh, PD sessions. They are being uploaded to the Washington Open Education Resource website um, this week and next week. Uh, unfortunately, they're not quite available yet. We'll have to send you the link to those when we get the link uh, later. And then hot off the press within the last weeks or months has been the Global Assembly Toolkit and a Global Assembly Information Booklet that really break these uh, assemblies down into their component parts and how to, how to create one. So 
let's see. Getting a bit more granular now, looking at the uh, next generation science standards and the standards that are explicitly addressing climate change. These are just focused here on, on the high school and a, a one middle school and four high school standards. And this document, which we'll give you a link to, um, is from the University of Maryland and the University of Delaware. It's called Made Clear. And they've identified what's called explicitly or standards that explicitly address climate change, some that are approximately related to climate change, and others that are distally related. And so there's only the one at middle school, four at high school, and really none at elementary that are explicitly addressing climate change, which means that's the focus of the standard. But there are lots of others that are approximately and distally related, and the document uh, both defines that and gives examples of each. So, however, there are other standards in the engineering technology and society category and in earth and human activity category that are written very open-ended, like examine a global um, environmental issue. And if you choose climate change as that issue, you, there are a number of other standards that could be pulled together into this project. Um, in the social studies, on the social studies side of things, a social studies teacher that I'm working with now in a pilot project is, has identified at least these four, if not more standards that would be really easy to address through a climate assembly. He's confident we should be able to do so. So deliberating public issues and understanding civic involvement in particular, using credible sources of information, including the videos that we have of the experts and interested parties uh, participating in resolving issues at the local, state, tribal, and national level, dead on. We can definitely hit those in a climate assembly project and the other two as well and many more. So, of real interest to me is the combination of these three standards. You've got two at the high school level um, on engineering technology and society and one from social studies. Those engineering technology and society ones, they use the engineering design process to come up with a solution. And all too often, science teachers will think that, well, we need to apply that to make a technological solution. That's really not the case. You can use engineering design process to come up with economic, educational, social, and other uh, solutions to problems that don't really involve technology being at the center of that. So if you can apply the engineering design process within the deliberation process, you've just wedded social studies and science in a pretty significant way and covering a lot of standards in one uh, unit instead of separating it out into two different uh, subject areas. So I'm very keen to explore this further with the teachers I'm working with. So while there's a lot of benefits to a project like this, there's also um, some design challenges, which are also opportunities. It may require changes to the classroom schedule uh, so that social studies teachers and science teachers who wanna share students can do so on a cross-curricular project. That would also be great to include scheduling uh, cross-department planning time for the teachers. It may require reordering or modifying curriculum by teachers. And it may involve getting past climate change denial and polarization within students, but that's a huge opportunity too within the schools. Potentially a controversial topic in the community. So some um, publicizing of what you're doing and why you're doing it may be needed. And inviting in community members to participate as Derek was talking about. And then identifying a focus question, like the one that John shared for the Washington Climate Assembly, that is both relevant to students and to decision makers in the community. We want this real world base. So whoever's designing these needs to go out into the world. It could be even just at their school, the district, or into their city's planning departments and find out what they're doing about climate change, and then come up with a relevant question for the classroom that motivates students, but it's important to decision makers as well and making it directly relevant uh, to everybody. So, and we're working on all of these challenges in a new pilot project that I'm just beginning with teachers at Bellingham High School. We've identified one social studies teacher, three science teachers, 
um, that are willing to work on this. I just met with them yesterday. And the model we're looking at right now is the one where the learning sessions would largely happen within required science classes, of which they've got three years. The standards that I mentioned before are spread throughout their three-year curriculum. And then when they get to be seniors, they'll take a civics class, required civics class, within which the deliberation will occur. So ultimately, this means if the school really adopts this and go for it, every student at Bellingham High School will have participated in a climate assembly before they graduate. So we're currently seeking funding for this through Climb Time, uh, pending the success in future funding. We hope to expand it and include more schools. So if you're interested in being part of that in the future, again, please be sure to share your email address with me. And then finally, ultimately, we'll be creating, uh, amongst other things, a student climate assembly toolkit and a series of professional development sessions to go along with that. They might be available as early as next year. We might have a couple, but two years out, we should have a fair amount of tools and, and publications available. And I'm going to race backwards real quick because I seem to have skipped over um, this slide, or at least part of it. So I want to mention quickly that teachers already do model United Nations projects in their schools or something like that. So and if climate assembly can substitute for that, and again, that's been verified by the social studies teacher I'm working with. I've already mentioned how the project could integrate science and social studies. But the possible models are the ones, again, where just a single science teacher, a single social studies teacher could team up if they can find a way to share students. And the next one I mentioned is what we're modeling at Bellingham High School, but it could also be done as an extracurricular activity as part of an environmental club or civics club, or in Derek's case, as a student leadership group and other options that hopefully you and others will help us come up with. Um, so I'm going to facilitate our next portion. Um, so while I'm getting the slide up, I want to invite you to reflect on a question. Um, when you think about incorporating a climate assembly or a student climate assembly process at your school or in another educational setting, uh, what first comes to mind? And you don't have to type anything. You don't have to just self-reflection. And I'm going to get the slide up here. Um, there's going to be uh, groups of three and um, or four, three or four in your breakout room and um, basically just quickly introduce yourselves if you don't already know each other. Um, and then um, your response to the question, uh, what do you think about incorporating a climate assembly process at your school or other educational setting? Are you excited? Are there barriers you would need to overcome? Would you need support? I'm going to share my screen again. And give you all an opportunity to share with us, which we'd really appreciate on this document, um, your responses to these questions, which are complementary to the ones you just discussed with your, uh, with your partner. And you may all be familiar with Etherpad to begin with, but to add your responses to these questions, and there's five of them. How important do you think a project like this is to yourself, to the world, to students, to you know, whatever, and what gets you excited about it. And given what you just learned, do you think it'd be possible to incorporate one of these into your curriculum or programming? And what are the challenges and barriers for number three? What would you need? Or what do you think teachers would need if you're not a teacher in order to develop and implement a student climate assembly? And what questions would you like to ask us that we haven't answered yet? Uh, just to reflect back a little bit, um, please continue to type. But first of all, I want to mention that I'm aware that um, all of you are working in positions that serve schools and districts, and it doesn't look like anybody's an actual teacher in the classroom. So I appreciate your comments from that perspective. Um, you know, number two, coming from an informal educator standpoint, for us, it would be working with teachers to supplement or scaffold an existing curriculum. Yes, um, hopefully we'll have something like that ready within a year or so, and that will be a possibility. And partnerships would be key, absolutely. And hopefully you have your connections with schools and classrooms already. 
but it's also an opportunity to build such things. But that also gives me a thought that that's something that we as program project designers and consultants on this need to build into our uh, toolkit, how to make those connections and partnerships. So thank you for that. I'm appreciating the youth voice. I see in there too. Great, glad to hear that. Yeah, engagement leads to increasing learning, dead on. You know, to be honest with you, my whole reason for coming into education in the 1990s, yes, I'm recently retired, um, was to bring service learning, particularly around environmental and sustainability education to the classroom. And it definitely has engaged teach students more than just your typical classroom curriculum. So. Oh. I just read one under number two. You tried this in 2012 and were never successful. You've come a long way and I hope this is possible. Thank you for your insight on that. And uh, hopefully with new and different uh, world that we're in now, something like this will be supported even more than it was before. Yeah. And Maybe I I'll agree. point out I'm mm -hmm. sorry, uh, I'll point out there's a comment about rural schools. Um, yes. Uh, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. and John, you want to say more about that? What, sure. what does it mention? Yeah, the, the climate change is, is only just now becoming something in, uh, for our rural schools. Yeah. And, it, and it's a little bit tentative right now. But I, I, coming from a rural area myself on the North Olympic Peninsula, I understand that. And, um, but a, a lot of the rural, rural areas have come a long way in understanding uh, about uh, the climate change and what we can do uh, in our communities about it. So mm -hmm. I think there's a great amount of potential there. Yeah, and I mentioned the service learning I did in sustainability education. Um, surprisingly, I taught at both Berkeley High School and in Squim High School and talk about ends of the spectrum. Um, I actually did more sustainability education in Squim than I did in Berkeley. And partly because I got a grant and yes, it was difficult navigating it at times. Um, I had some letters written to the newspaper about my work that got published, but we managed through that quite well. So yeah, this is one of the difficulties for uh, implementing this curriculum in some other places and that aren't so friendly with these topics. Yeah, that's a really key question to try and get some insight into where we're at now. And maybe um, we could add that under question four, um, maybe I'll add it under question four. You know what is what are where are we at with um, the ability to use these concepts in rural communities? I live in rural Island County, although the um, area that I live in maybe is a bit more accepting of um, the reality around the climate emergency. But um, we have a uh, wearing my E three Washington hat. Um, we have a board member who's a fifth grade science teacher in Okanagan School District, and she's interested in this topic, but has that same concern. So I'm guessing that that concern, although it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the student assembly, climate assembly concept itself, I could imagine that mm -hmm. Kim. All right, representing. <laughs> yeah. So. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for everything you've added in here. Um, I'll invite you to, for each one of these, if you read one that really likes that you go, yes, I really agree with that and resonates with you, please put a plus one at the end of that statement. Or if you see one that doesn't resonate with you at all and you, you know it's not a concern, you can put a plus minus, but plus ones are just fine too. We're curious across the board. This is just what I was hoping for to get lots of ideas and feedback yeah. on this. It's really a very, very early in our pilot uh, program with this. I can share with you that the um, science coordinated Puget Sound Education School District, when we first mentioned this to her, she jumped on it right away, very excited about it, uh, ready to push the edges of climb time funding, which is generally focused on science and climate change. But this is an opportunity to um, do interdisciplinary work. And so we're kind of pushing the edges of climate time as well. Everybody knows we need this kind of integrated curriculum to address climate change and prepare students accordingly. 
but there just hasn't been much that's broken through those barriers of those silos in secondary schools. So we'll see what we can do about that. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, David, I think I should um, yeah. wrap it up for, for our yep. session, if that's okay I will with stop everyone. that share. Uh, and I do um, really like David and Derek, we really appreciate all your written comments. Um, they're very rich and they're gonna really help help everyone move forward on the use of this wonderful climate assembly tool to solve difficult problems. Thank you, David. And we'll get out, we'll follow up with an email with that information and links to the presentation and everything. So um, I think that's it for us. Uh, just uh, on behalf of my, my wonderful colleagues, uh, Derek and David, um we would we greatly appreciate you spending time in a late afternoon with us uh, for an hour um and and again thanks to e3 washington for allowing us to present on this really important topic so yeah so thank you all so much this is really a wonderful presentation um and i just want to close uh with this uh, slide and feel free to um, involve yourself more with E3 Washington. And um, I will see you around maybe tomorrow or around the committees. Thanks everybody.